All rise. Please be seated. So, go ahead, Mr. Rufus. May it please you, Your Honours. Mr. Taylor, before we adjourned, we were talking about these allegations made <coughs> against you. Do you recall that? Yes, I do. When did you arrive in the United States? I arrived in the United States in uh, oh, late 83. Uh, Can you give us a month? No, not precisely. <clears throat> what kind of a passport did you use to travel to the United States? I used uh, an ordinary passport. And what was the route that you took? A Côte d'Ivoire, and then on to New York. And did you travel alone? Yes, I did. Now, you were married by this time, were you not? That is correct. Was it a Liberian passport you were using? Yes, it was. Now, what about your wife? Did your wife remain in Liberia? She uh, stayed behind. <clears throat> in fact, my wife, my wife had been in the United States all along, and she was aware of what was about to happen. So she had come down to Monrovia, and I'm glad she did. Um, Hard-headed, some of us wanted to uh, to stay there and see things happen, but uh, she came down and uh, prevailed upon me in the last minute to leave. Uh, and she stayed behind as I left the country. And did she remain in Liberia? No, she followed thereafter. And by this stage, how many children did your wife have for you? Uh, by this stage, we didn't have any kids yet. We were still in the very early stages. But she joined you in the USA, did she? That is correct. How soon after you arrived? Almost immediately. Almost immediately after I arrived. And just uh, dealing with one small detail before we go on with the narrative. Your wife, Tupé, having arrived in the United States shortly after you, tell us, um, did you stay together? Yes, for, for some time we did. Yes? For how long? I would say we, we stayed uh, uh, together for, I would say, about six to eight months. And then uh, an incident occurred and we broke up. Yes. And uh, were you seeing somebody else at the time? Yes, I was. Who's that? I was then uh, seeing a lady called uh, Agnes. And you were later to marry her, weren't you? That is correct. Now, <coughs> you arrive in the United States late <coughs> 1983. Oh, there about now, yes. yes. What happened shortly the after your arrival? <coughs> Not immediately. I, like I said, uh, Tupi and I lived together for uh, a long time. I say about six, eight months. Uh, and then during this particular period, there was uh, uh, around about early '84. Uh, I would say about February, if I'm not mistaken, 1984, <coughs> uh, the government of Liberia uh, advanced an extradition uh, request. Uh, let me just <coughs> clarify something for the court. 
before we because in your question you use the word allegations uh, the issue before me at the time I was Deputy Minister of, of Commerce uh, and in response to your question I said to you do really probably didn't back this we had not reached uh, the stage where Clarence Mamalu's accusations and I want to call it his accusations because if there had been anything substantive in the issues raised about government funds it would have been handled by the Department of Justice. Clarence Mamalu is not a prosecutor. So it was this internal squabble he gets to the agency he begins to talk a whole lot of real you know nonsense but it had not reached uh, the point where there was an ongoing legal process of uh, a legal investigation by the county attorney or the Ministry of Justice. So it had not reached there after seven months of his talks. So I, I want to clarify that for the court. So as we move now into the United States, it is not until February of 1994 uh, that. 94. Uh, excuse me. Am I? This is my, uh, yes. Uh, 94. Pause. Um, let me just uh, take my time here. 84. 1984. That an extradition request is made uh, by the Liberian government to the United States formally charging me with embezzlement and asking for me to be extradited to Liberia to face charges of embezzlement. Now when you left Liberia in late 1983, were you the only prominent Liberian who left at that time? Well I left. Server left. I, I cannot just account for where they went so maybe that may come later, but several others fled, including uh, uh, Moses Dupo, uh, Harry Nguyen. They fled from the capital. I fled out of the country. Some of them fled into Nimba, uh, and this is where the other part of the conflict comes up, where there is a famous raid in Nimba that door begins. But the, the fleeing from Morovia, most of us fled. I fled out of the country. Mm. In any event, in any event, what was the consequence of the extradition request made by the Liberian government? <clears throat> the extradition request was made. Um, after several months of, of uh, haggling up and down, um, it, it, it depends on because it has to be presented here as a full story. Uh, there are things happening that I think is important for the, the court to know. I'm in the United States. At the time of the extradition request, we are still working. I go to the United States. Working on what? That's what I'm coming to now. I go to the United States, but the plan to remove Doe is still at foot. I return to West Africa, trying to find General Kuwampa because linking up with him would continue the plan. On my first trip, I do not find him. I come to La Côte d'Ivoire. I do not find him uh, because I didn't even know, and he had kept very quiet, he is hiding in Sierra Leone. So then I returned to the United States. By the time I get back to the United States, this is about uh, the middle uh, of 80. Uh, 
the extradition papers are already circling. Uh, we know that um, these requests have been made. Uh, the United States government has not yet moved on it because I guess they are still studying it. And we know the reason why it took so long, uh, and I'm sure, I'm sure the judges know this, but I'll just explain it. Extradition, the, the, the issues that are dealt with uh, in extradition cases, and this is why I mentioned before, I was not on any criminal investigation in Liberia at the time of my departure. I want to make that very clear. So the extradition requests, on the extradition requests, there are only two issues that are decided. It is mostly a political decision. The first issue that is decided on the extradition, and this is why the United States government took so long, by the court, even though it is processed through the court, the first issue is, is there a valid treaty? The court only has to decide on the validity of a treaty. Thus, after the court has decided, the court's functions are finished. It is then the decision of the Secretary of State of that nation to decide as to whether the political situation in that country is of such that that citizen can be sent back to face trial. So the United States government, I was not on trial for embezzlement. I was only being asked to be sent back, not even having been on a criminal investigation before I left. I just wanted to get the court to understand that part, okay? So the extradition request comes through. The United States government is taking its time to consider it. Uh, I get to know later why it is taking so long, but eventually I am arrested. When are you arrested? I'm arrested, uh, I would say, on about uh, June of 1984. And just so that we get the chronology correct, the extradition proceedings begin in February. Am I right? The proceedings begin, yes, from Liberia, not from in the Liberia. U.S. courts. That is correct. Thereafter, you travel to West Africa and return. That is correct. And it's upon your return in June of 1984 that you are, in fact, arrested. That is correct. At that stage, are you placed in custody? Immediately, yes. Where were you placed in custody? Um, firstly, I'm arrested in Boston, uh, Massachusetts, and I'm taken to the Plymouth County House of Correction. And where is that? That's uh, uh, way out, outside of Boston. Uh, I would say, I, I can't really calculate. I would In say which state? Massachusetts. Okay. And for how long are you held on remand at that institution? I'm held there for about 15 months up to about, I would say, uh, November. Uh, 1985. And during that 15 month period, what's happening in terms of the extradition proceedings? The court has already decided that there exists a valid treaty between the United States and Liberia. The courts are finished. The matter is now at the Department of State to determine if they should go ahead with the actual movement of me into Liberia. It is no longer a matter of the law. That's finished. Now, did you instruct lawyers in the United States? Well, yes. Um, I did obtain the the services of uh, the uh, former United States Attorney General, Ramsey Clark, 
Uh, he was attorney general during the Johnson administration to uh, represent my interests uh, during my incarceration. And uh, after you were held in custody, were any further steps taken by the Liberian government to secure your return to Liberia? Oh, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> you, 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 you have to imagine uh, they were very anxious. Uh, uh, Doe wanted me back, but we, our, our concerns, in fact, what what delayed the request was this. Everybody, and when I say everybody, I'm referring to the United States government, knew very well that at stake at that time had nothing to do because, I mean, with $900,000, because that was not the issue. $900,000 had been paid to a vendor. The vendor had admitted that he had received the money. So, and they could have gone after the vendor for the money. The money was not paid to Charles Taylor. They knew that the money had been processed. But at the bottom of it, they knew that Kuangpa, having disappeared, that Do wanted me because he knew that Kuangpa and I working together would have been a problem. So the United States government was very aware. And what was at stake at that particular time was the Department, the Secretary of State, was concerned that I would be killed if I was sent back to Liberia. So within that period, there were discussions going on, and I guess, and I was not part of those discussions, I would say from experience, trying to maybe secure assurances from the Doe government that no such thing would happen. Mm. So it took some time uh, because the courts had decided within the first three months that there was a valid I would say three to six months that it was a valid treaty. So they were finished. Mm. The rest of the time was just diplomatic arguments, agreements. And the United States, in a way, I will believe, and I'm not quoting from any U.S. sources, uh, but they were aware that General Kuangpa was planning his return. And from my own diplomatic instinct, and I'm speaking about the contacts that I had from the prison with General Kuwangpa, I think that the United States, and this is a thought only, I have no official statement from the United States government, they did not want to send me back to Liberia. I think they were sure that Doe would harm me. But knowing that something was coming up, I guess they were buying time for that to take place before I was sent back to Liberia. And, and, uh, and I want to be honest, I'm not saying this because somebody told me this, but because of the work that they were doing at the time with General Kuwangpa, fearing that I would be killed, not wanting me to go back, all systems buy time. And it is my own genuine belief, and I'm not speculating, that they were buying time and really didn't want to send me back. Let's pause and seek your assistance with one little detail. Tell me, who was Solicitor General at the time in Liberia? Uh, the Solicitor General at the time that uh, was processing that extradition sits in this court right now. He was Counselor Lavalle Superwo, my lawyer. And uh, as Solicitor General of Liberia, he was seeking your extradition from the United States, wasn't he? That is correct, but he was one of the progressives too. Now, you were telling us about people that Kwiwampa was working with in the United States. Who was he working with in the United States? Now, <clears throat> Kuwangpa is with the two Catholic fathers and James Butte. I speak to him on a collect call from speak James to whom? General Kuwangpa uh, on the telephone uh, from the, the Plymouth County House of Correction. You have to uh, call collect calls. 
I'm not sure what they do in other places in America. And I speak to him several times, but we cannot really talk. I know he's there for a reason, but he sends uh, a gentleman by the name of Harry Nua. Spelling, please. Uh, that, oh, I would say N-Y-U-E, and it's really Nua. Nua. Uh, some people call it, they say Nua, but it's Nua. Uh, told me to visit with me at the Plymouth uh, County House of Correction in Massachusetts. And he briefs me of what is going on regarding uh, what's being put together uh, in urging that I have patience. I then say, ask him to... No, before we get ahead of ourselves, mm -hmm. what does he tell you is going on? Uh, he tells me that uh, uh, the particular agency that I mentioned, I'm working along with them, um, let's not be coy, Mr. Taylor. Which agency? Well, we've said the CIA. I mean, I mean, who's that going to beat this up? Right. Yeah. So let's use CIA rather than agency, please. Okay. So help us. What did he tell you? That they were working very closely with the general and that uh, plans were afoot to uh, return to Sierra Leone. I mean, to, not return, to go to Sierra Leone and that all all plans had been uh, put together for the training in Sierra Leone and uh, the eventual uh, move into Liberia. And let me just, uh, Your Honors, I want to, uh, I, I made a statement here earlier about who was president. Now, <coughs> I, I may be a little off. It had to be somewhere between Siaka Stevens, because I remember Kuang Basi, the old man. But old man, because I'm in prison in America, I'm not, it, it could have been Siaka Stephen who later died and Mamo took over. I will have to reflect my memory on this. And I'm sure it's in the record I said Mamo, but I thought about it because he kept saying the old man, the old man. And uh, most of us knew Siaka Stephen as the old man. Okay, so I'm told that they are moving, they are planning, uh, and that the weapons and equipment will be given and that, in fact, they will be paid for. So the, the weapons from, from the Sierra Leone government at that time, I am 100% positive that was used by General Kuangpa was not a donation. They were paid for by the CIA. Okay. And Mr. Griffiths, this Mr. Nguyen, um, is he Liberian? Yes, he's the Harry Nguyen is Liberian. Uh, he was sent to me to brief me. Um, can I take advantage of this hiatus, uh, uh, Mr. President, to mention a spelling from this morning? James Fromayan. It's J-A-M-E-S, the normal spelling, and the surname is F-R-O-M-A-Y-A-N. So you were telling us the weapons had been paid for by the CIA. That's correct. What else were you told? And that the, the training would be done by what, what I told you before. It would be done by the SSD. Uh, Dumuya would, would conduct the training and that Liberians uh, would be brought to Sierra Leone for the training. And that was done. Now help us. Why were you incarcerated as you were in the Plymouth County Jail being told this? The relationship uh, between uh, General Kuangpai and myself was very strong. Uh, as a matter of fact, um, I may have not mentioned, I had suggested to the general that uh, uh, Dr. Famole be contacted and brought on board. Uh, but then you suggested that? Oh, I, I suggested that uh, to the uh, general why I was uh, in, in prison. Uh, in, in, in the United States. And I said to him that uh, he needed some very strong people around him, and, and Dr. Farmer was brought on board. So what are you telling us? Were you conspiring with Kwiwampa and others to stage a coup in Liberia? Yes. 
And why were you conspiring with others to do that? Well, let's get, then we have to add the history to this. Uh, let's don't forget, the progressives and the majority of Liberians want Doe and the PRC to return to barracks. Doe does not want to return to barracks. General Kurongpa, Thomas Kurongpa, is then removed from his place, his place because he is supporting the return to civilian rule. A coup is planned then. It does not take shape. We flee. I go out of the country. He goes into hiding. A group of those individuals that were supporting the, the coup in Liberia get disgruntled and go up to Nimba and raid uh, Satan, a company is called the Lamco Mining Company. Doe begins to carry out the beginning of the, the killings in Nimba. We are all out. We are still planning. General Kurongba succeeds in getting out. And the whole process is continuing. So we do not stop because we are determined. Now, I am in the prison and Kuwangpa now gets in America. He has the backing of, of, of the, of the uh, government of, of the United States, but the CIA must operate with their, uh, well, at least the acquiescence at certain levels. And the whole thing is rolling. I mean, I see this as a way of survival myself. If it succeeds, I know I will come out of jail because if sufficient pressure is put on the United States government, um, by pressure, let me see if they are sufficiently convinced. There's very little pressure you can put on the U.S. government. But, I mean, if, it, if I stay in jail long enough for them to be convinced that, okay, well, maybe we can send him and nothing would happen, I'll be a dead man. So I, too, am anxious, and I want it to happen. Hmm. Now, help me with something else, Mr. Taylor. On the one hand, you have told us earlier this morning of the extent of United States largesse towards the Doe government in terms of financial assistance. <coughs> now you're telling us that an agency of that same government was planning or assisting Kwiwampa to overthrow that same government. Can you help us with that, on the face of it, contradiction? No, there's no, there's no contradiction. Um, <clears throat> the assistance to the Doe government covers the period from the PRC to the end of his government and his assassination, well, his killing <coughs> by Prince Johnson at the beginning of uh, the revolution that we launched. Now, within that period of time, that is before the elections of October 1985. Which e elections were? In Liberia. Mm -hmm. Doe is not really, really, really favored by the, ex, ex, I would say, the international community to really stay on. What, what these people apparently were doing, they assisted Do in ways that were sufficient to encourage him to leave. He probably interpreted the assistance as them wanting him to stay. But the views of the strong man, as he used to be called, General Thomas Kurongpa, Thomas Kuhnkwa was really liked by the international community, and the views coming from him and most of the other segment of the Liberian society was for the army to return to barracks. So there's nothing out of the ordinary that when this coup fails, and immediately thereafter, several months after, Doe brings forward an election in October of 1985. That election of 1985, Doe says he wins by 50.9%. Uh, 
the international community and all Liberians believe that there's another candidate in this particular electoral process called Jackson Doe, no relationship to Samuel Doe, actually won the elections. So here we have it. Here's a man that they do not want. Someone else wins the election. He takes it. So all systems now are open to General Kuangba to hurry up. And if we can touch this point, in November of 1985, Kuangba attacks. Okay. We'll come back to that in a little more detail in a moment. But in any event, you're arrested June 1985, yes? And you're in... No. 84. 84. And you're in custody for 15 months. That is correct. So that takes us through to when? Uh, about uh, August <coughs> 80. No, no, no. That, that, that puts me all the way up until November, uh, because I do get out of jail in November of 1985. Now, it's that Houdini episode that I want to talk mm. to you about now. Okay. How did you get out of jail, Mr. Taylor, without a Monopoly-type get-out-of-jail card? How did you manage it? <clears throat> well, I, I must say that I will be able to explain to a great extent how I got out. There's some of the details I don't know, but I'll explain to the judges. While in prison, this whole episode is being developed. Episode, I mean... The, uh, the, the planning and training are going on in Sierra Leone. Harry Newell comes to me and he informs me of the details. I then ask him to, to, to state to General Kuwangpa to ask the United States government to release me. Why? Because of the contact that I am told that General Kuwangpa has with the government, well, since there is this diplomatic stalemate, if you have sufficient contacts at the level that Kuwampa was dealing with, he could have said to them, well, look, release Mr. Taylor, because it is apparent that they would not have sent me anyway. I'm in jail about three, two to three days. I don't know the date of the actual attack on Monrovia. I do not know. But I'm released from jail about two to three days before the attack. As I arrive in New York City, the attack is already uh, gone. Uh, about uh, three to four weeks before, uh, one of the uh, prison uh, guards uh, in a supervisory uh, position uh, came and told me that I would be leaving the prison. And he wanted to find out that if I was let out of the prison, if I could actually get out of the United States as quickly as possible because upon leaving, I would have to leave the United States. I said to him, I said, well, it would be a little problem, but I will get to my wife and ask her to, uh, you know, to raise uh, a certain amounts of money that would be made available to me if and when I got out. Now, that was a little sticky because my wife and I are not living together. I have now moved to Boston where I'm arrested. I'm with this girlfriend, Agnes, who later becomes my wife. But my wife, Tupi, and I had bought a piece of land in New Hampshire. So I had to authorize her to sell the land to raise some money that when I got out of jail, I would be able to do something. I, the Plymouth County House of Correction is both a minimum and a maximum security facility. The minimum security facility of that jail, uh, you have people who are about to get out, they go work in the fields, come in, go out. It's virtually for people that, you know, who have no good reason to get out of jail because in that facility you are there. Within the building, you have to walk from maximum security 
through so many gates to get into minimum. And the minimum side of the jail is, is really minimum. Low walls, as people walk out and do what they have to do. On the date that I reported back to them, to the guard, and told him that I had arranged with my wife, and after she assured me that she had sold the land and had some money, we had to really give the land at rock bottom price. I told him that we had some money. He verified my passport. Uh, he verified that I could get out. I can remember one evening at about 10, he came, opened my cell. It was during lockdown time and escorted me from the maximum security side through server gates to the minimum security side where there were two other detainees there standing. They, they were already out. <coughs> they had already, I don't know who cut it, but I think the guards had made these arrangements. Those two guys and myself with the guard, this one guard, and I do not know and will not lie if he was operating with anybody else, but I believe that he had to be operating with somebody else. I was taken out. We got to the window. These guys took a sheet. We tied it on the bar in a very short distance, and we came down, got over the fence. There was a waiting car outside. There were two guys in the car. These other two guys and myself got in the car and drove, and their instruction, the guys who were driving the car's instructions were to get me as far as New York, where I had told them I wanted to go. They drove me from Boston. We stopped in Providence, Rhode Island. My wife came, brought the money. She was in a second car, and the two cars drove. The two guys that were driving the car insisted that I not drive with her. I should stay in their car just in case we were stopped by state troopers. I followed those instructions. I do not know those guys. They never identified themselves to me. I had never known them before. They drove us all the way to New York. I got out of the car and I showed them that it would be okay. And then I met a sister of mine, a half sister of mine, and I stayed at her apartment. Those guys, plus the two guys that broke out of the jail with me, I have not seen or heard from them today. Now, what do I mean by I do not know the full story? It is my assumption, and I want to be very clear about this, because I did not pay any money. I did not know the guys that picked me up. I stayed in New York for about, as I'm in New York, the coup is going on in Liberia. I cannot get a flight out of New York on time. I was not hiding. All this nonsense about being such, I was not hiding. I did not get a flight out. I was still in New York when Jerome Kurongba was captured. I stayed in New York for about two or three weeks. It was decided that by my sister that since things had gotten out of shape, by this time, every news agency is reporting that Charles Taylor has escaped from jail. I drive on Interstate 95, not hiding, from New York after about two weeks to Washington, D.C. I spent a couple of days in Washington, D.C. visiting a friend of mine, the late Eric Scott. From there, I drive all the way to Atlanta, Georgia, board a plane, fly to Texas, spend time there with uh, uh, some family, friends down there for about another month, and then go on to Mexico and fly to, to West Africa. How did you get into Mexico? We drove right across uh, the U.S. border there in an open car, well, not an open car, openly. We drove across at the U.S. Who's border. Me? I was uh, there. My half-sister that I talk about, Anne Peen, uh, plus her daughter. Could you give us that name again? Peen, Anne like in A N N uh, P A Y N E. We drive across. No one, all of my documents uh, are inspected. 
We drive across the border. We get across. I'm given a visa at the, I'm not sure if it's changed right now because I could be asked about it. At the time I crossed the border into Mexico, you don't get a Mexican visa on the border, not on the border. You had to go, I think the visa was giving me some, I think 10, 20 miles inside Mexico. There's a area there that you go. If you want to go into Mexico City, you had to get a visa. But when I traveled through there at the time, a visa was not required, neither was it required at the U.S. border as I crossed any specific things. But I'm trying to say my name was on my passport, Charles MacArthur Taylor. No one asked me any questions. We drove across. Which passport was this, Mr. Taylor? I was using an ordinary passport, a Liberian passport. Was it the same passport you had used to enter the United States? Uh, no. I had used uh, a diplomatic passport to enter the United States. Uh, that passport, that passport, they, it, it was left at two-piece place, so I didn't have that one. So how did you get this additional passport? Oh, in government, we all, not knowing what would happen the next day, we had a diplomatic passport and we had an ordinary passport because once you get fired from government, you are no longer entitled to a diplomatic passport. So there was always an ordinary passport that we kept. And so that was the latter that you used to enter Mexico? That is correct. And then you told us that you applied for and obtained a visa? A visa, yes. Uh, <clears throat> that's another strange thing. We were given, I was given a visa uh, at this town, not on the border, somewhere inside Mexico. But this visa was not stamped into my passport. The visa I was given on a small slip of paper that you hold in the passport that if any questions were asked. I don't know why they did not stamp it in uh, because when I get to this place and I request the visa, this particular Mexican immigration officer had several visas uh, stacked in his bag, in his carrying briefcase. Um, I think it's a system over there at the time where visas were not stamped, but the visas are given on this slip. I get a visa to enter Mexico, and I then go on to Mexico City, which is a little distant from the main border point. And strangely, at this time, there had just been an earthquake uh, in Mexico City that had just hit the city uh, when I reached there. After that, I bought a ticket. To and, where? Uh, and boarded a Sabina aircraft, Sabina, I think it's SAB, and uh, the Belgium Airlines into Brussels, and then on to Ghana, West Africa. Now, let's just pause there for a minute. <clears throat> By the time you've made good your escape and arrived back in Africa, the attempted coup by Kwawampa, no, the elections of 1985 have taken place in the October. Is that right? Uh, yes, the, the election took place in October. Then in November we have the, the coup. The coup by Kwawampa. Yes. When Kwawampa is arrested and killed. A few days later, yes. And that is in November of 1985, you tell us? That is correct. So what date is it when you arrived back in West Africa? Because, I mean, I was very sad. I was very sad. I am still in New York City when Kuwampa is arrested and killed. That must be clear. So in other words, I, I've missed the whole thing. Um, and it appears that my release from the Plymouth County House of Correction was intended to, to, to be in West Africa for this particular situation because I am out, I get in New York, and about a day and a half to two days after my arrival in New York, the coup is, is, is in action. I have already missed, because the original plan I had said, I was going to catch a flight out of GFK straight into West Africa. But I did not, we were delayed, and my wife, my ex-wife, panicking, 
was very slow in getting to me. So we were delayed in Providence, Rhode Island on a highway waiting for her to reach me. These guys were just so adamant. I said, well, let's go. They did not want to go. I'm talking about the two guys that had the car. That car was a type of secure car because they insisted that I would have to stay in that car until I got to New York because if I got stopped on the highway in the other car, I would be probably picked up. So I stayed in their car. My assumption, again, was that it had to be a government car, that they were sure that I would not be taken out of their car. Okay? So we go all the way. So that delay now, I think, caused me not to be present for the coup. Okay. I just want to clarify one detail before we carry on with the narrative. Earlier, and I'm sure it may well be my fault, earlier today you told us that when you fled from Liberia and went to the United States, you traveled on a Liberian passport, an ordinary passport. That is correct. You've told us now, a couple of minutes ago, that it was a diplomatic passport. So which is it? Well, let's see. I, I hope I didn't misspeak. I'm saying that I, upon leaving office in Liberia, you do not have a diplomatic passport. I entered the United States on a diplomatic passport, but I left the United States on an ordinary passport because the diplomatic passport had been left at Tupi's place when we broke up. Mm. We moved from New Jersey. I was now in Boston. Mr. Taylor, I want us to be very clear about this. So let us just recall the details of what you told us this morning. Mm -hmm. Initially, you, fle you flee from Liberia and you go to the United States. That is correct. Extradition proceedings begin in the February of 1984. That is correct. Yes, uh, Ms. Hollis. Well, I hesitate to rise, but this is direct examination, and if counsel wishes to go over these matters again, it would be more appropriate to ask the witness to give the information. He's essentially summarizing testimony. Mr. Griffiths. I'm merely clarifying something, uh, Mr. President. If my learned friend would advert to page 54, line 15, I am merely seeking to clarify that. All right, thank you. I'll, I'll overrule the objection and allow you to continue your clarification, yes. Mr. Griffiths. If I understand the account you gave us, Mr. Taylor, you leave Liberia, you go to the United States. That Stage is two is the issuance of extradition proceedings. That is correct. You then go back to Africa and return to the United States for a second time. That is correct. Now the question is very simple. On the first occasion that you left Liberia and entered the United States, what passport did you use? I traveled on a diplomatic passport. On the second occasion when you returned to the United States again, what passport did you I'm use? I'm still traveling on a diplomatic passport. When you leave Mexico, when you leave the United States, enter Mexico, and travel to Belgium, what passport are you using? I'm traveling on an ordinary passport. Thank you. So you then return to Ghana. That is correct. Now, help us with this, please. By this stage, the Kuiwampa coup has failed. That is correct. Why then are you returning to Africa? Well, <clears throat> upon my release, well, I'm calling it a release because I didn't break out, so to speak. In Ghana is my good old friend, Dr. Henry B. Famule. While I am still outside, I am in touch with Dr. Famule. Uh, who is now in Ghana. The coup has failed, people have scattered, and most of those individuals did not hang around Sierra Leone. After the failure of the coup, they moved into Ghana. 
He then encourages me because everyone knows that I'm a part of that whole operation, even though I'm still behind. He encourages me to come to Ghana uh, because he is good friends with uh, senior officials uh, of the then government of uh, Rawlins who had just come in. And that friendship, that friendship was very deep because uh, for those that may not know, at the beginning, Jerry Rollins has just uh, come to, uh, to power into Ghana, and it starts off as a Marxist-Leninist revolution. And so the Moja people are deeply rooted in Ghana. He invites me to come to Ghana. That's how I come to Ghana. Now, we will come back to the Ghanaian episode in a moment. But let us just complete the Kwiwampa episode. After the killing of Kwiwampa, what happened after that in Liberia? Well, <clears throat> you, you, you need, I think your original question, I think we need to, clear, you know, to, to complete that cycle. Because I think the question was, what, what caused me to come back to West Africa? The, the fire is still burning. Uh, Famula is in this particular place, and they're still hoping that they can regroup. Okay, so I really wanted to, to end that part of the thing to uh, answer your question. Mm. But in the meantime, what's been happening in Liberia following the failed Kwiwampa? Doe Do has now unleashed the full force of his uh, army uh, and he is really on a I would call it a bloodletting spree uh, Nimba is being practically torn apart who's in charge of this well uh, Samuel Do at that time had a very famous uh, general by the name of Charles Julu, that's J-U-L-U, -U, uh, who was in charge of uh, uh, the operations in Nima County. Uh, but I want to mention that that spree that I referred to did not just occur in Nima. Uh, there were other counties that suffered as well. And by suffering, I mean individuals from the Pele ethnic group, the Loma ethnic group, uh, any, any ethnic group uh, that was one sympathetic to, uh, to General Kurumpa, or if you were a member of the armed forces and you were from any of these ethnic groups, you were also targeted. So Which ethnic group was Kurumpa from? Uh, Kurumpa was from the Ma. That is M A H and the Ma ethnic group, sometimes uh, called uh, the uh, Manu, but the actual name is Ma. Like you hear Gil in Liberia, but the actual name is 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 Da. The the Da ethnic group, people call them Gils because it's the language. The Ma ethnic group is what you call the Manus. So he was from the Manus or the Ma ethnic group. And in which county in Liberia are they concentrated, those two groups? They are concentrated in Nima County, and they're so close that the Mans speak Da, and the Dans speak Ma. So if you are Gil, you speak Gil and Ma, not because you can almost uh, uh, understand each other. So, and, 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 and maybe it's important to note here why this bloodletting was so bad because in Nima County, since you mentioned the county, you also have crowns that live in Nima County. And these three ethnic groups are really relatives. So the crown, the ma, and the da are three ethnic groups that so in Nima County, why you had the ma and the da, there was a segment on the border with Grand Jude where the crowns are predominantly settled, you have crowns in Nima. Okay, so uh, there are other tribes, but 
I'll wait until you find out because mm. whoever was in that area uh, had the, uh, uh, the, the, the full weight of, of, of dough at the time. And when you say weight, what are we talking about? Our killings, burnings, lootings, raping. Uh, there was a terrible situation that followed. Uh, don't let's forget now. Kurongpa has come to Morovia. He's failed. It is believed that his uh, ma and down fellows in the army are supporting him and that the youth from Nimba County uh, are supporting him. He's been captured. He's been cut into little pieces. It was on television. His flesh was eaten by the military people at the time. And Do is now in control. He begins a revenge a situation. This is what I'm explaining. Mm. Now, let's jump forward for a moment in order to come back. When you began the revolution on Christmas Eve 1989, Mr. Taylor, which county in Liberia did you choose as your springboard? Naturally, Nimba. Why? During this terrible orgy uh, on the part of the Doe government, uh, a lot of the young men and women fled Nima County into La Cote d'Ivoire uh, by the hundreds. And so you will get to find out that the, about 90% of the people that we use to train as special forces are these fleeing Nimbadians and I'll, I'll put that percentage, it's 85, 90, because there were other tribal groups that joined, but they were predominantly uh, from the Man Dan ethnic groups in La Côte d'Ivoire. And so the natural return where uh, obviously we would uh, uh, get the sympathy, the corporations, and assistance from the general population was on my mind. So naturally, uh, we chose to, uh, to launch the revolution from there uh, and it was planned as such, because if you look at the quantity of people that we use, uh, you don't launch a revolution with the number of people that uh, we use, but there was a plan that they would be the forerunners of the revolution, but we were depending on the population to launch the revolution, really. Let's go back now. So you arrived in a Ghana ruled by Jerry Rawlings' regime. That is yeah? correct. You have chosen to do that because uh, Dr. Farnbuller, who you've spoken to, yes? That is correct. And you decide to join him. That's correct. Now, were there other anti doe dissidents living in Ghana at the time? Oh, yeah. The cream of the Moja crop were all in Ghana. Dr. Farmer was there. A gentleman I mentioned before uh, during the morning hours, Tom Kamara, who is presently the editor of the New Democrat newspaper that does not get tired writing about Charles Taylor, he was there. He was also in the training camp in Sierra Leone. Also in, in Ghana is Komene Wisa that I mentioned before in my, in my testimony. They are all now settled back in Ghana. <clears throat> and so when you arrive, do you meet up with this group? Yes, I do. Every one of them. And What's being proposed at this stage? Well, there are plans. Some people are suggesting. Uh, first, it was anticipated. In fact, they, they really expected that Ghana uh, would have helped them re-intervene. That was not forthcoming. So there was this uh, scramble right away to try to see how pieces could be put back together for this whole idea to be launched. And let me... I mentioned what I failed to mention earlier in one of your questions. 
This group that attacked Liberia, led by General Kuwongpa, was called the MPFL. That was the name of that group. And I, I want to interject this now because my MPFL was the second MPFL that came after that first MPFL. So I think it's important to mention that they are there, and we are all beginning to throw ideas around on what to do uh, that the, this whole idea would not fail in that do uh, should not be left alone to, uh, you know, to rejoice after everything that he had done. Now, are you living in, are you living in Ghana by yourself at this time? No. Uh, shortly uh, thereafter, Agnes joins me in Ghana. Now, when you say that uh, Kiwampa's group had been called the NPFL, what did the NPFL stand for so far as the Kiwampa group is concerned? The National Patriotic Front of Liberia. And the group you later formed, what did that NPFL stand for? National Patriotic Front of Liberia. So they both had the same meaning? Same meaning, same name, and I can almost say same organization. Now, did you remain unmolested in Ghana? No. What happened? <clears throat> I arrived in Ghana. Dr. Fomler receives me. We're going along, and some... Uh, three, four weeks into my arrival there, I'm arrested by the Ghanaian authorities very strangely. And I am accused by the Ghanaian security at the time of being an agent of the CIA. So I'm saying to them, what are you talking about? But, but the argument was, at this time, and this is the little catch 22, Rawlings comes to power in Ghana, is a Marxist-Leninist revolution. It starts along that line, and there are serious conflicts with the United States. The cousin of Jerry Rollins, by the name of Michael Susudis. Spell that for us, please. Oh, I. Susudis. S U S I D I S. Susudis. Uh, he is, uh, that name is a European name, I'm sure, Susudis. I, and I stand corrected on this. I guess uh, that's what you guys will be doing. He is arrested in the United States and charged with espionage. Rollins retaliates immediately by arresting even some American officials and some Ghanaians that Rollins claims are CIA spies. He arrests them too. And so the argument is, but wait a minute. You cannot tell us that you got out of the prison in a maximum security prison in the United States and come here if the CIA didn't help you to come, so you are a spy. So I'm caught in this web of, there's a major problem. We can find, I'm sure the Ghanaian, is a, all, it was all documented. So this problem is going on between the two governments, okay? I am now arrested as a U.S. spy, whereas I am not. But they believe that, they, they believe in the impossibility of escaping with all U.S. assistance. And because this scenario is taking place at the same time, I fall into that. I'm investigated. Uh, for several months, I mean, I'm held at the security quarters for about six, seven months. I explain by this time, Dr. Farmula and the groups around there are working very hard trying to explain that, no, uh, uh, he is uh, uh, coming here. He's a part of what we were doing, but he was in prison. But they just had to go through their security own analysis, and then they granted me asylum in Ghana, and that was what you may call uh, some form of molestation, but that was what happened at that time. Now, after your release, what did you do? 
I'm released, realizing that the people that I meet, we are friends, but ideologically there is a divide. I then begin to... What divide? Well, they are Marxists, I am not. And so the direction they want to go, I don't want to go down their route. I begin to pursue my own route and then begin to contact people in La Côte d'Ivoire that are, are more uh, are, are seriously connected to our general belief. And who are these people? There is the very Harry Noir, who does not come to Ghana. He's in Ivory Coast. There is another gentleman called Moses Duopu from Nima, uh, from the Igu ethnic group, uh, who was with me in the Union of Liberian Associations in America. So most of those that were not along this Marxist nonis orientation did not come to Ghana. They went, they fled to La Côte d'Ivoire. I then started moving in and out of La Côte d'Ivoire, trying to join them to organize our response to what Doe had done. And so, where were you actually based during this period? At the beginning stage, I'm based in Ghana. But there is another arrest in Ghana. After I begin these movements, and apparently these groups seeing that I am making some progress, I am rearrested in Ghana for the second time. On what, for what reason? I tell you, this time these guys didn't accuse me of anything. What they had said was that they were working with the group in Ghana to uh, try to do something in Liberia and that what I was working toward was going to either expose or counter what they were doing. So my arrest really was just to stop me, I guess. I'm sorry, Mr. Taylor, I really don't understand that, and I may not be alone. What do you mean when you were telling us that uh, they were working on, they were working with the group in Ghana to try to do something in Liberia? What are you saying? Okay, well, uh, you have a point there. Kurongbai is dead. The desire to go back and, and, and fight Do is what I'm referring to. They are working in Ghana trying to organize uh, recruitment and all to... Who's trying to do this? A group, the Moja group now in Ghana. Under Dr. Farmula and the rest of them are trying to recruit. In fact, they do recruit some people uh, to be trained to relaunch this uh, revolution in Liberia. Are they being assisted by anyone? Well, they are definitely assisted by their comrades in this new Rawlings government at a particular level. Whether Rawlings knew, I can't speak for it, but there are different levels when you're operating in these things. Maybe uh, the, the close people that were operating with Formula and these people were the diehards like uh, Captain Shikata, Kojo Shikata, who was the head of national security. He's an old revolutionary. Uh, Shikata, I think it's T.S. I, uh, you guys going to have to help me with this one, but the name is Shikata, Koju, Captain Koju uh, Shikata. And so they were working very hard. And but you said they were training. Yes. Uh, and where was this training taking place? Uh, my understanding is that they were training at a place called, again, don't ask me to spell it, Achiansi. Uh, is a place outside of Accra at a uh, gorilla base at, the, at a town called Achiansi. We may have to get the spelling for that. And do you have any idea what kind of numbers we're talking about in terms of those being trained? Not at all. I did not go there because I was trying to pursue my line because my whole orientation was not Marxist-Leninist. And this is why I moved away from them and moved into La Côte d'Ivoire in and out to organize uh, something other than what they were doing. Because I did not believe that uh, if they succeeded, that a Marxist uh, a revolution in Liberia was the right thing, and I was opposed to that. 
And just so that we're clear, Mr. Taylor, those training in Ghana were training to do what? I just say restart what Kuwangba had just lost, what they had lost, to restart the attack, the revolution in Liberia. That's what they were training to do. So are you suggesting they were intending in due course to invade Liberia? Oh, definitely, definitely, without a doubt. Without a doubt. That was the whole purpose. And so just so, again that we're clear, we have a situation then, do we, where there is this group training in Ghana to invade Liberia, and you're trying to organize another group in Cote d'Ivoire for the same purpose. That is correct. I see. And had you managed to progress your own <coughs> idea in, in, in Cote d'Ivoire? Yes. I succeeded in bringing all of the groups that were in La Cote d'Ivoire together. Everybody was happy to see me on my first visit. Uh, and they too were just there, anxious too, and were thinking about the same thing about planning to return. Because in reality, uh, and, and I can just predict, the group training in Ghana uh, could not have been a very large group because when I reached to La Cote d'Ivoire, the vast majority of the people from Nimba, whether they were ex-soldiers that had fled Liberia, were in La Cote d'Ivoire. So that appeared to me then to be the base of where we would get what we wanted. But we were faced with a very serious problem. There was the idea, there was the manpower. The question then arose, how do we train, where do we train, and where do we get assistance from? That was the dilemma right there. Mm. But in between times, as you've indicated, you're arrested for a second time in Ghana. That's correct. And help me, on what basis? They did not really accuse me, as they did before, of working for the CIA. No. This time, they just said that I was uh, doing something that would interfere with what uh, they were planning, I was planning and meeting groups in La Cote d'Ivoire to stage this return to Liberia to overthrow the government. They were doing the same thing and that I would disrupt the process. And so they just kept me, that's all. For how long? Eight months. Eight months. How many times were you in custody the first time in Ghana? For about six months. And then on this second occasion for eight months? Eight months. And upon your release, what did you do? Before I'm arrested, I have succeeded in putting together the individuals in La Côte d'Ivoire for this operation. I had also succeeded in making the necessary contacts for where the training would occur and where assistance will come from. I have contacted, while in Ghana, the late good friend of mine, the ambassador <coughs> of Burkina Faso, uh, the late lady Mamuna Yatara. Spelling? Uh, Mamuna is, uh, I think, M-A-M-U-N-A, -A, Mamuna. Yatara is Y-A-T-A-R-A, -A -A, Yatara. And her position? She was ambassador. Me? She was ambassador to, to uh, uh, Ghana from Burkina Faso. Mm -hmm. Now, <clears throat> I had visited Burkina Faso, and I had been lucky to have uh, uh, met with uh, the late Tamam Sankara, who became a very good friend of mine, and his immediate deputy, Blaise Compowery. And that's C-O-M-P-A-O-R-E, Blaise Compowery. And so who had, uh, uh, upon my request, uh, put us in touch with uh, the 
Libyan section dealing with pan-African activities at that particular time. Now, Pause there. Hmm? Where was that Libyan connection based? In Ouagadougou, at the embassy. There was a bureau, there was an office there. I was introduced to, to them, and I asked uh, to, uh, to meet some authorities in Libya to see how this, uh, because at that time Libya was the champion, uh, and rightly so, of pan-African activities in Africa at the time. And I'll probably get into that uh, if that is the desire of the court. <clears throat> Let this pause for a moment and deal with some spellings. Kojo Chikata, K-O-J-O Chikata, T-S-H-I-K-A-T-A. -A. Achiasi, Ghana, site of training, A-C-H-I-A-S-I. Thomas Sankara, S-A-N-K-A-R-A. -A. As yet, we can find no spelling for Susidis. Right. So you've made those contacts, Mr. Taylor. And uh, help me. You'd made those contacts, did you say, before you were incarcerated for the second time by the Ghanaian authorities? That is correct. So upon your release, what did you do? Well, let's, let's not fail in making one connection here. Uh, remember, the contacts are made. I go to Burkina Faso. I meet an individual introduced to me. I travel to Libya. The entire plan now uh, has been put together for the training of these Pan-African uh, forces and I returned to Accra. On this particular leg where I'm now going to La Côte d'Ivoire to begin the movement of the men for training, I'm arrested. And I'm saying now that the Ghanaian authorities knew all along what was going on. So this arrest was to cut the process. And so I'm held in jail for eight months. While I'm in jail, the process does not stop. Uh, Thomas Sankara is killed uh, by his forces, and his deputy uh, takes over. Who's his deputy? A place compari. And uh, a renewed request is made to the Ghanaian government for my release. I'm released and given 48 hours to leave Ghana. I'm, I drive directly from Accra into La Côte d'Ivoire and on to Ouagadougou. That's the connection I wanted to make. And so by this stage then, the president of Burkina Faso is someone with whom you'd already struck up a relationship before your arrest. Yes, he and his deputy. So what happens when you get to Burkina Faso? By the time I get to Burkina Faso, the, the first uh, two uh, groups of uh, individuals that are to go to Libya have already been sent. Pause so, there. Mm -hmm. How many people are we talking about? Uh, the, the, the two groups... I would, would make no, they went in small groups. Uh, the first group may have been 18, 20, the second group along that line, and this very blood that sat here was in that second group, Moses Blah. Moses Blah was in that second group? In that group. second group, that is correct. And uh, let's just get a little timeline here, please, Mr. Taylor. By this stage, your second release, what year are we in? All we have to add now. <clears throat> Take your time. October uh, 85, 
Uh, November I arrived in Accra. I begin this whole process. Eight plus six, fourteen. So we are now looking at around late eighty-six, eighty-seven. If you had the six months, I'm initially arrested. I'm out for some time, and then the eight months. So we we're, we're getting into eighty, the beginning of eighty-seven. Right. Or thereabout. And so by this stage, we've already got two groups of Liberians in Libya being trained. No, not in Libya. Not two groups in Liberia. I mean in Libya. You have one group in Achiansi, but in Libya you have yet my group. Uh, but there is, strangely, okay, there is something going on there. Because we meet a Liberian group in Libya also. So we meet a Liberian group inside Libya. I don't understand that. Uh, I, sometimes it beats me too. Uh, Dr. Henry B. Famule, uh, while in Ghana, had apparently some little differences with the rest of his colleagues and had himself carried a Liberian group to Libya that were already in the training camp when my group started arriving. So in fact, yes, there are two Liberian groups training in Libya. There's another Liberian group training in Achiansi in Ghana. Now, where in Libya is this? The, the groups are being trained uh, outside of uh, Tripoli. And I guess we're going to probably deal with uh, uh, why we chose Libya, because there was a good reason for that. But okay, let's deal with why we chose Libya. <clears throat> well, We are dealing with a, a period, and I'm talking about uh, between the years, I would say almost 1980, Libya is now championing pan-African activities in Africa. Rightly so, and I think that it is an effort that uh, we ought to be very proud of. And what do I mean? At that particular time, every major revolutionary group or activity happening on the continent of Africa, had it not been for the, and the very, very good work done by the Libyan people at that time, they would not have succeeded, whether it had to do with Uganda or whether it had to do with South Africa, where the struggle was, now we know it to be South Africa, but that revolution was about Anzania. That should have been the name. Or whether it was South West Africa, uh, 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 that was called South West Africa, that now we know as Namibia, or whether it was Ghana. The very Ghana that the uh, the Honorable President of the United States just went to was without the assistance of Libya and the Mataba that we went to at that time would not be Ghana as we know it now, or Burkina Faso, or most of the pan-African movements in Africa at that time were rightly so supported by Libya, whether people liked it or not, including maybe some other external groups. So that this, I'm trying to explain to the court, is the, is the period of the pan-African movement and the only person that, was, that had the, the guts to support pan-African activities at that time, since Kwame Nkrumah was already dead and others, was Gaddafi. So we chose there because there were no strings attached. These were not terrorist camps. These were pan-Africans that were fighting, trying to stabilize things. And without him, a lot would not have happened. That's why we chose there. And so we moved our people there uh, to take the training. 
uh, in discipline, okay, to begin to go back to, to, to really uh, un unleash our people from, from, from this whole colonial yoke uh, that still remain upon Africa. Now, Mr. Griffiths, did I hear the word Mataba? That is correct. How do you spell Mataba, Mr. Taylor? M A T A B A. The Mataba is the Pan African organization within the Libyan uh, 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 organizational structure responsible for Pan African activities. That office is called the Mataba. Now, getting back to your specific question, they were trained in a town outside of Tripoli at a place called Tajura. Pause there. I wonder if the witness could be shown, please, our exhibit 208, which should be at tab number one, Your Honors, in Binder number one. I'm just going to show you what you're reading. Now, Mr. President, I intended at this stage to go into a little detail about events in Libya with the assistance of these maps. And I note the time, and rather than open it and then have to adjourn, would this be convenient? Yes, uh, I think it would be, uh, Mr. Gibbs. Uh, just before we do adjourn, though, uh, this map that you're going to show the witness uh, has already been exhibited. Is, is that correct? No, it hasn't. We've, um, we've uh, not exhibited any documents at all. I will be asking for this to be marked. Yes. No, I thought I heard you say Defence Exhibit uh, two, uh, 208. No, no. M my fault. I think I should prop more properly refer to it as DCT 208. Uh, I see. That, that's clear. Yes, th thank you. Uh, we'll, we'll adjourn now until 2.30. Uh, All rise.